Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All, so I'm at the uh, Supercharger <laughs> in Athens, just charging up a little bit. I'd driven out some miles, and so I figured I would go ahead and get, we still have some uh, free Supercharger miles to use up. So anyway, be that as it may, sorry, there's a little bit of a whine in the background because that's what happens when it's charging. Uh, speaking of which, actually, this is one of the EV misses about charging and all the issues with charging, and definitely check out that episode if you haven't yet. It would be good for your friends if not for you. There's a bunch of stuff where I clarify a bunch of myths about um, EV cars in general and Teslas in specific. So anyway, but today I wanted to talk about uh, Elon Musk and Tim Dodd's um, interview that they just, he just released it today, this afternoon. I guess I'll probably put this out tomorrow morning. I don't know. We'll see what, <laughs> we'll see what happens. Anyway, I'm recording it in the evening, obviously, but um, he, Elon had a couple of quotes that were really interesting. Number one was that he says in order to make going to Mars a reasonable thing, they have got to reduce the cost of mass to the surface of Mars, useful mass to the surface of Mars, and I'll get into that in just a second, by 10,000 fold. And he was very specific. He said, I don't mean 10,000%, which would be 100 fold. He said 10,000 fold. So he was say, basically saying one metric ton currently costs approximately $1 billion. So if the Curiosity rover, I don't know exactly how much it weighs, but let's say it weighs one ton, that's approximately $1 billion to deliver that one ton to the surface of Mars. And he's saying that's got to be reduced by a factor of 10,000. So a billion divided by 1,000 is a million divided by another 10 is about 100,000. So he's talking about something like $100,000 per ton. And that may not sound like all that cheap, but when you consider if you could take that much to another planet, I mean, Mars is far, far away. So if you can get things to Mars at $100,000 per ton, that is a massive, massive savings. And it's really fascinating to think about how that could really open things up. Of course, it makes it much, much cheaper in that case to go to low Earth orbit. The moon, weirdly enough, has approximately the same delta V as going to Mars because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. So it takes a lot longer to get to Mars, but you have to do all of the braking to get to the moon and to land on the moon. So there's a weird sort of correlation that even though the moon's only, uh, oh gosh, it's 240,000 miles, but what is that in kilometers? <laughs> 40,000, four, sorry, 200, yeah, 400,000 kilometers approximately. Anyway, so, you know, it's way, 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 way closer. Obviously, it's up in the sky. You can see it. It's way closer than Mars is, but because it doesn't have an atmosphere, it actually, the delta V necessary within, you know, the fuel, the propellant in the spacecraft is approximately the same. So weird little coincidence. But anyway, so that that is one of the things that's really fascinating. It's really fascinating to think about the fact that he really feels like Starship could actually make that happen. Uh, it's that big of a step change in, it's not just a step, it's like, you know, there's step changes like this, the Starship, if it works, is going to be a step change like this. He did reiterate, interestingly enough, that they are going to, um, to orbit almost. <laughs> so, so they're going to put Starlink satellites on this test vehicle. I think it's Starship number 24. I believe that's the one that they're looking at launching. It has a bunch of heat tiles on it. And at this point, interestingly enough, he did say the heat tiles do not make a complete, um, they don't completely cover the surface, the, the windward side of the Starship. And he said that's because even though I guess they're made out of ceramic, they will actually expand somewhat. Probably the metallic surface underneath it is going to expand even more. So they'll actually expand out and they'll cover more uh, they'll, they'll actually fill in those gaps. And also the Starship is going to be coming in at an angle. So it's not going to be going straight into it, but going up the um, up the heat tile. So interestingly enough. Uh, but anyway, so there, there's a lot of really interesting things going on with that. Uh, he also said, uh, what was the other thing? Oh yeah, there's a potential scenario where we can delete the forward flaps entirely. That was a really interesting thing. The, the, the interview itself is just fantastic. I'm super jealous of Tim Dodd getting to essentially it's exactly what I would like to do is just hang out with Elon Musk just either in the Gigafactory in Texas or or at Starbase honestly I think he kind of is more intrigued by space right now than he is by Tesla uh, that would just be my sort of gut feeling but part of that might be the fact that he's always 
doing interviews with people who just ask him uh, the same old questions over and over again, kind of surface level questions, things he's already answered, stuff that he's not really interested in. But you can see this with Tim Dodd, that Tim's just like, here, you just go, you know, walk around, tell me about what you're thinking. And you can see Elon Musk actually going through. He talked about the Ullage motors. Um, Ullage motors, by the way, are when you're in space and you turn off the rocket engine, all the liquid, you know, the propellant, the, the oxygen and the methane just starts floating around. And so you need small motors to push, to slightly accelerate the vehicle so that all the stuff settles to the bottom before you can light your main engines. So you can see that happening in the Apollo launches. It's very, very cool with the ullage motors and everything. And you can see in the Soviet uh, rockets that they don't often use ullage motors, which is why they have kind of a wireframe mesh between the stages because they actually hot stage. So as the one stage is burning out, they'll actually fire up the second stage and push themselves away uh, so they have to have some sort of like place for the, the gases to escape as they light the other motor but anyway so all the motors but but Elon was talking about how they're going to be doing reaction control thrusters which allows you to orient the ship and the ullage motors are going to be using the overpressure gas from inside the main tanks. And he said that the last time he was doing an interview with Tim Dodd, he thought about that. They, you know, Tim was like, why don't you just use the, the pressure from the tanks? And Elon was like, oh, wait, that's probably a good idea. So anyway, they're going to be using that in the booster. But it's just fascinating to watch his his brain constantly working. It It's it's just, it's incredible. I actually tweeted that he had, he had designed ADD and I meant that in the best possible way because one of the things about ADD is that you're willing to jump really quickly, but you can also hyper-focus. And the fact that he's willing to talk about getting rid of the forward flaps on the Starship entirely, which saves weight, it saves complexity, things like that, is, is an incredible, incredible, like, you know, mental leap to be able to do that. But then you have to focus. You have to have this incredible hyper-focus that's the opposite of attention deficit disorder, uh, is, is that you can just, like, get into something and really, really focus on it. And the way this would work, actually, they have, uh, what was it called, chines? I think it's called chines, but these little teeny, like, little, little baby kind of runner fin things towards the bottom to increase the drag at the bottom because most of the weight after the tanks are empty is at the bottom. So the booster is going to want to go like this. It's going to want to like tip straight down, especially because it's got the, um, the grid fins at the top, which is acting like a dart. You know, if you ever throw a dart, the weight of the dart is in the front and the feathers are in the back. Same thing. It's going to want to go straight down, but going straight down means it's very aerodynamically efficient and what you don't want that you actually want it on its side. So anyway, so they're talking about creating the, the they are having these little chines on this and, uh, to, to create extra resistance as it's falling to cause it to be more sideways. But, and that's for the booster and for Starship. And Starship itself, of course, has the big, like, giant flaps at the back. But the way you would get around needing the flaps at the front is that you would have your center of pressure, which is as it's coming in at like a 20, 30, whatever degree angle, there's a place where there's the maximum amount of force from the wind. And then there's a gravitational center of mass, right? Which is probably going to be lower than the wind pressure center of mass. So it's going to want to flip like this, but you can utilize that to actually turn the vehicle you know, up and down and also back and forth sideways using only the back flaps and just some basic physics. Now, it's got to work through a lot of regimes. It's got to be hypersonic into supersonic into subsonic. There's a lot of regimes it's got to work at, but you can see, and and the um, a couple of his associates were there and they were talking about how complex it was to think through these things and how they have a lot of internal debates. Remember, this is stuff that nobody's done before. So they're they're out there just exploring possibilities. I've talked about this before with Tesla. It's fascinating to see it happening with SpaceX as well, that they don't have, you know, they're wandering in the dark, trying to find the path, assuming that there is even a path. There might not even be a path, right? So they think there's a path, they're in the dark, they don't have a flashlight, and they don't know if they're going the right direction. So there's an awful lot of assumptions. Now, you know, if and when they get to the point where it actually works, it's all going to see, seem completely obvious in retrospect, and people say like, oh yeah, that's the way it should be designed. But it's not, that's not the, the kind of, we don't get that automatically. We have 
we have them wandering around in the dark trying to figure out the best way possible. So there's a likelihood of many mistakes. You could see Elon was actually almost in physical pain looking at the front flaps on the uh, Starship number 24 because he knows that they're not optimal, but at the same time, he also was repeating the fact. He was like, you could almost see him convincing himself. He was saying, we've got to get into space. We've got to launch this thing. We've got to put it into orbit. We've got to see how it's going to work, even if it's suboptimal. But there's a really big piece of him going like, <clears throat> we should get the flaps on the back on the leeward side so they're not so much on the windward side we should stubify them we should make them super tiny we should you know or get rid of them if possible uh so all of these things will be happening in the future but you can also see that probably Gwen Shotwell is like no we're gonna launch this version of the vehicle we've got to get something into space uh interestingly enough they are going to carry Starlink 2 satellites so they will be going very very slightly suborbital speed so they still will be re-entering the atmosphere in the south in the pacific and then kind of going near to hawaii where the if assuming everything goes well there will be a soft touchdown in the ocean i don't know if they'll try to recover it or not you know I, it might also just sink but the odds that it'll actually make it through all of those steps in soft land in the ocean are pretty pretty crazy anyway but as they do that, they're actually going to carry a useful payload of Starlink 2 satellites, which are the new ones with lasers. <laughs> but but they will, they're will they in a Pez dispenser is the crazy thing. There's like a little door that's going to slide down. And these guys are, are like little flat, you know, they're kind of box shapes. And so they're going to come up on some sort of like pallet loader sort of thing and then get spit out. So they'll be like, ping, ping, ping. so it's sort of like a Pez dispenser, basically. Open it up, it pops out and it shoots off into space. And so they will release these things in that sort of method. Uh, anyway, so it'll be fascinating to see how all of that stuff works. I, I'm super interested in finding out how, uh, you know, whether this happens. I really hope that we can get down to Texas to actually watch this first launch. That's a big cross to our fingers. But anyway, that's a lot of positive news about what's going on at SpaceX right now. I know that I often talk about Tesla, but it's also, I'm incredibly fascinated by space stuff, which is why Elon Musk is like my hero. It's like my two favorite topics are like EV cars and, and, and artificial intelligence and going into space. So <laughs> happy me. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this brief little talk about this. I can get into more detail about some of these topics if you're interested. If you did enjoy this, please do like the video so other people can find it. And of course, consider subscribing. As always, a big shout out to my patrons on Patreon. And in the meantime, everybody have a lovely weekend. I will talk to you all soon. Bye-bye.